<laughs> so our last panel is looking at some kind of conceptual uh, um, perspective and we have four great speakers. So I will first give the floor to Antonio Campati from the Catholic University of Milan looking at liberalism and political representation, the pluralism and future of liberal democracy in Europe. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, also for me, it's the first time uh, in, the, uh, in the United States and then uh, Washington. It's uh, a great honor to be at this university. Thank you. The title of my presentation is Illiberalism and Political Representation. Two concepts that I think it's very important to study contemporary illiberalism trends. Several decades ago, Giovanni Sartori already saw a dangerous gap between democracy and liberalism after a period of happy convergence. Uh, in fact, he wrote that uh, after a long and happy convergence, they seem to be diverging again. The great risk was uh, that one might unconsciously begin to work to for an illiberal democracy, deluding delu 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 uh, oneself that the eroding parts of liberalism one could increase democracy. As he recorded, uh, other many articles, the fusion of democracy and the liberalism took place in a rather recent period, in the mid 19th century. The emblematic date is the 1848, when Alexis de Tocqueville observed that the antithesis between democracy and the liberalism no longer exists, because there is a new antithesis that between and uh, between uh, democracy and socialism. So. Today, with the spread of illiberal democracies, has Sartori prophecy come true? Can we say that democracy and liberalism have diverged again? For Sartori, illiberal democracy is a form of authoritarianism. And he argues his conclusion by breaking down the two elements that make up liberal democracy to emphasize the importance of the constraint. The liberal component is liberating, it frees the demos from the oppression, servitude, and despotism, and the, the democratic component is empowering in the sense uh, uh, that it empowers the demos. Thus, uh, liberal democracy for Sartori is uh, firstly demo protection, the protection of the people from tyranny, and second, demo power, the allocation of increasing the shares of power to the people. The crucial point for Sartori uh, is not so much to understand which of the two elements is more important, but to put them in the right order. If there is no first demo protection, there, are, there can be no demo power. Sartori's least lesson is still useful to understand the present, because today the liberal leaders are presently proposing a split that alters the functioning of liberal democracy. As uh, uh, young Werner knew, notes, Viktor Orban makes a conceptual split when he uses the, the term a liberal democracy to describe, describe his political project. In fact, the Hungarian leaders clearly present itself as a true democrat, but reject the liberal tradition, presenting it in a complex and superficial, superficial way as the expression of the democratic elite in Brussels. In other words, he separates democracy from liberalism. He embases the formal and leaves the latter. In this way, liberal democracy as a combination of demo, pro uh, demo protection and demo power no longer exists. We know uh, there is a, a, a hard debate uh, 
about the correctness of the term you know, liberal democracy. Scholars of political regime use this term to refer a particular regime that means a certain set of requirements. Some political leader, like Orban, refer to the political project with this label. And finally, there is an important tradition of conceptual studies that consider the term to be inaccurate. For example, uh, Roberto Bobbio, uh, for Roberto Bobbio, liberal democracy is the only form of effective democracy, while all the others form are apparent democracy. Uh, the perspective uh, we, it, I think it's very important. Uh, sorry, there is a problem with the slides. Uh, okay. So, uh, the perspective we want to be in is the theoretical concept of one, the last uh, of the three. Uh, in this sense, it's uh, very interesting the perspective that suggests a shift from the, uh, from the adjective to the noun. From illiberal, illiberal to illiberalism. This shift uh, redirects the discourse of political doctrine and political concept and thus to rediscover the root of the union between democracy and liberalism. Uh, for me, some analysis of the illiberal crisis here today uh, do not substantially consider the original of the term liberal democracy is history. And then the, I think the shift from objective to noun remind us that democracy is based on political doctrine, not only on a set of formal procedures, both, but not only from formal procedures. So I would like to propose the hypothesis that within contemporary democracy, the idea of eroding parts of, the, of liberalism to increase the, li the label of democracy can be fatal for democracy because the system of political representation is eroded. As we know, the marriage of democracy and liberalism is the result of a long and boundary road. Uh, to simplify, we can say uh, the liberalism focuses on the individual while democracy focuses on society, graphically, liberalism develops in the vertical dimension, while democracy develops in the horizontal dimension. Liberalism calls for freedom, and democracy calls for equality. This image uh, was proposed by Sartori, uh, and uh, uh, Sartori imaged liberalism and democracy <clears throat> as two lines intersecting at right angles. The point of intersection makes the zone of convergence, but the vector remains divergent. This is obviously a simplified representation, but uh, it uh, gives an idea of the close link between democracy and, um, and liberalism, and uh, of the fact that if one of the two elements is missing, the point of intersection no longer exists. For my point of view, the intersection corresponds to the system of political representation. Because the system of political representation is a point of balance between the form of direct democracy and indirect participation that are the basis of the representative democracy. Uh, I think that in order to study the risk that a liberal democracy can produce, it is necessary to rediscover the contribution that uh, political representation has had to mitigate the illiberal forms of the pure democratic system. In fact, a system that develops only horizontally do, uh, does not guarantee does not guarantee the representation, the political representation. Originally, liberalism 
was an instrument of resistance to democracy, understood as the unlimited power of sovereign people. As Sartori remind, uh, remind us, it is an illusion to think that by eroding the liberal part of liberal democracy, we can automatically have more democracy. Yet, uh, this seems to be the intention of illiberal leaders who propose precisely a democracy that is closer to citizen, people, and the style to elite and their interests. So, I have no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, from this basis, I think uh, it's uh, necessary to study liberal democracy with a complex and you know, simplified vision. Then I think uh, it's very important to rediscover in the dimension of democracy and their internal tension. One of them is clearly the one, the one between uh, the freedom of individual and the need to represented. In a previous work of mine, I focused, I focused on the democratic distance that exists between elite and citizen. The distance, the democratic distance, defines the space in which intermediate bodies operate, which are the subjects that guarantee social and political pluralism. The distance the guarantee that in democracies there is free participation of formal representation. Uh, I think uh, the, this, interpre this interpretation cannot be made without thinking about the effect that contemporary democracy is structurally defined by the, rela the re rela uh, sorry, relationship between democracy, so democratic principle, and liberalism liberal principle. It is therefore necessary to rediscover the dimensions of democracy, the vertical of liberalism and the horizontality of democracy as ele elements at the center of the balance. This balance is promoted by the action of intermediate bodies, like party, unions, uh, uh, associations, and so on, that guarantee the pluralism of democracy. If illiberalism, illiberalism is an anti-pluralistic theory, then it undermines this balance. In his interpretation of post-liberal politics, Andrew Pops argues that the new corporativism, quite different from the fascist and the social experiences, but must be reinvented to allow citizens to feel free and protect from the state economic and financial constraint that bind modern democracy. It's an interesting perspective that overlaps with the analysis proposed here. But uh, I think the big problem is that for many countries, as Rastor uh, Gold says, Liberal democracy is no longer a model to emulate. There are good reasons for such, uh, for, for this skepticism. The poor quality of political classes, the malfunction of the institution, the low rate of responsibility. Nevertheless, liberal democracy uh, is worth defending. From this point of view, the noun is much more important than the objective. The question is, is, big question, yeah, great question, is liberalism still a doctrine that can be useful for our democracy? Probably uh, we uh, must also again turn to the great master, the great father of the past, such uh, as Alexis the Tocqueville, to remind us that a liberal democracy is always balanced between the affirmation of the sovereignty of the people and its deliberate limitation. In other words, we must remember that the principle of representation, delegation, and mediation 
derived from liberalism. Contemporary liberalism, sorry, contemporary liberal democracy has developed on these principles. The illiberal change, the liberal trend today push us to review our democracy, to rethinking our democracy, to understand whatever the balance on which they are basing are still valid. But uh, I think some adjustment need to be made. But I believe it is still important to preserve the system of representation and the social and political progress. Thank you. And now I would like to give the floor to Michael Zabotkin from Freie University in Berlin, friend of four conservative parties, populism and liberal democracy. Thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking all of the organizers and of course especially Marlene for inviting me here. It is also my first time in both Washington DC and the US and I'm really, really happy to be here. All right, without further ado, let's go. So I want to start by situating a little bit uh, my paper in the broader context of my PhD dissertation, uh, which is driven by this kind of basic question. So why do incumbents, you know, elected democratically in liberal democracies, want to undermine liberal democratic institutions thanks to which they actually came to power? And I mean, there are several kind of at least two easy answers as to what their motivation might be. So one approach is to say, well, they're the bad guys who really hate liberal democracy, like ideologically. They just don't like it as a political system and they would prefer something else, like electoral autonomy or monarchy or what have you. Um, and then there are different labels one can use to describe this kind of ideological hostility to a liberal democracy populism or anti-pluralism or etc. Um, there is another kind of easy answer, uh, which I kind of call like a film noir. There are only bad guys, like everybody is a bad guy. So all politicians are really hungry for power, and they really want to maximize it, so of course they want to undermine liberal democratic institutions um, and rule forever. The only question is whether they can actually do it or not. Um, well, there is some truth, I think, to both of these approaches, of course, but there are also limitations. Uh, with bad guys, it's kind of tautological uh, quite often because who the bad guys are, we know quite often only after we saw that, aha, they undermine liberal democracy, so they must be the bad guys, right? It's, that is why it's so difficult to predict beforehand whether a given politician will turn against liberal democracy once elected or not. And everyone was surprised when, you know, it happened in certain historical cases. Um, and of course the film noir kind of approach doesn't explain the variation why, well, some actors, which seemingly can undermine liberal democracy, don't do it. Um, I mean, not everyone expects, uh, for instance, like the Labour Party in Britain, if they have a parliamentary majority, to do away with democracy, even though they maybe could have done it, you know? There is something else going on. And uh, so in my dissertation, I kind of study the political conditions which generate these motivations for incumbents to undermine liberal democracy. So I focus on kind of strategic motivations. But in this paper, I zoom in on one particular question as to why it is quite often the case that it's a very specific type of parties, mainstream conservative parties, which undermine liberal democracy. I'm not saying that it's always, it always happens, no, but I'm saying that this is a big part of the puzzle. It's a quite common pattern, and I don't think by using concepts such as populism, etc., we can get far in explaining it. Or to frame it differently, it's clear that there are many parties which, uh, and voters which uh, oppose liberal policies, and they prefer illiberal policies. Now, I believe that it doesn't automatically mean that they will oppose liberal democracy as a polity, as institutions. Because you can oppose liberal policies, say, on gender rights or uh, LGBTQ plus rights, and still support, you know, political pluralism, uh, human rights in general, etc. 
I mean, and it what it has historically been the case, for instance, like in the fifties and the sixties, when homosexuality was criminalized, but we wouldn't say that therefore all the parties were liberal, right? Uh, but then there is something to be said about the possibility that opposing this cultural liberalism will lead you to also oppose political liberalism. And this is what I'm going to zoom into. Okay, really believe, really, I spent probably too much time on this in the paper, but I just, I'm fascinated by the fact that Linz, already in 1978, has wrote some things which seem very kind of relevant today. He said that, okay, so let's say that there is loyal democratic position which is committed to liberal democracy as such. There's this loyal position which hates liberal democracy as such, I wants to replace it. And there is semi-loyal opposition which has a sort of conditional loyalty to democracy. So it wants to preserve the democratic system as long as it works out for them pretty well. When it stops working out for them pretty well, they want to do away with it. Well, but what are the conditions uh, which kind of lead this to shift to either preserving or undermining democracy? One interesting pattern that he notes is that, especially new democracies, right, uh, victorious Democrats, they establish democratic governance and they anchor their preferred policies in the social, cultural, or economic field in the Constitution um, because they can, because they won. And then it turns out that opposing those policies, me policies means opposing the Constitution and means opposing the democratic order. Um, the interwar Spain with the kind of Republic for the Republicans slogan uh, for him is a case in point. Now, I believe that kind of, in a nutshell, what we also see today. To go back like a little bit, there is this concept of tutelary democracy, when certain domains um, of decision-making are reserved for non-elected bodies, usually the military. Uh, Fidesz government in, uh, since 2010 also is an example of that. When they came to power, they passed uh, new laws and adopt, um, changed the constitution in order to anchor a lot of quite specific policies, either as such, or to create uh, non-elected bodies which govern those. Um, and you can see it in, in many, many, many fields, etc. Now, I mean, everybody criticized that with good reasons, right? And the Venice Commission uh, has a nice quote in that, saying that, among other things, functionality of a democratic system is rooted in its permanent ability to change. So, anchoring those specific policies to prevent future governments from being able to easily change them is bad. I mean, you all can always see the logic in it, right? But shouldn't this maybe also apply to those typical liberal institutional constraints that we have, the contrary majoritarian institutions? Well, the answer is I usually know if, it, if they protect minority rights, it's okay, right? And also know if it brings to uh, efficiency, such as like independent central banks, uh, lead to efficient monetary policy, it's also okay. But then not everyone agrees about the central banks. Uh, the uh, first presentation um, this morning was the case in point, and I'm zooming in on the cultural thing in a way. Right, so yes, uh, I, def I focus on conservatism in the sense of cultural traditionalism, um, which is most pronounced in conservatives among the three mainstream right uh, party families which I deal with here. Right? And historically, um, in Europe at least, like uh, in interwar Europe and before that, um, class and religion were the two main cleavages and conservative parties took very kind of strong stances of both in favor of the elites in economic terms and traditionalism in religious terms. Right? Um, I mean, political Catholicism is one of those kind of cases in point, but it also existed in other countries as well. Um, and therefore, they supported uh, kind of authoritarian solutions because they were afraid of democracy, because politics were kind of this antagonistic competition about between different identity groups. They thought that they're in the minority, so there is really no point in having democracy because the poor will win, or maybe the secularists will win, etc. Why would you want that? And the Christian Democrats, in contrast, though sharing generally the traditionalism, they accepted democracy because they thought they had a more moderate view both kind of, of what they wanted to do and the masses, I guess. And they said that, well, under certain circumstances, with certain limitations, in certain kind of space, it's possible to unite Christianity and democracy and liberalism. 
Well, then the Second World War happened, um, and after that, the right wing of authoritarianism was, for obvious reasons, very much discredited in most of the countries in Western Europe, even though it very much persisted in Southern European countries, where those kind of regimes were actually established, sometimes for violence, as in Spain. Um, and kind of in this environment of the fear of revolt of the masses, who are supposedly could be easily led astray by a charismatic dictator or something, uh, the actual kind of model of liberal democracy as a very constrained democracy emphasizing consensus politics and not antagonistic class or religion politics as it was before, this was created. So it had two kind of elements to it. The institutional one, constitutionalism, international law, European integration, etc. And behavioral level, just elite convergence and party moderation, meaning that parties really just have to you know, be moderate and not promise some radical stuff to the voters. Um, they we usually tended to go together, but in principle they're distinct. Um, yeah, and I do not argue that the economic dimension of the story doesn't matter. I think it's very important. But it's also one which I think there is a lot more research on. The cultural dimension is what I'm focusing here. And I basically believe that it's especially in the cultural dimension we see the tension between liberalism and democracy, which was mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, yeah, so I believe that it can be said, at least for conservatives, that they certainly see it this way, that liberal democracy is institutionally biased towards the progressive side of the cultural cleavage, so, and the conservatives are on the traditionalist side, on the opposite side. Why? Because well, constitutionalism, which is kind of the foundation of the liberal democracy, is based on certain absolute values, like individualism, liberty, equality, etc., which are there whether the majority supports them or not. So the whole idea of the natural law is that the natural law is above the law that the parliament makes, the majority makes, right? Um, yeah, and thus these progressive uh, political preferences are locked in institutionally through the constitution, through the very language of human rights, etc. Um, and in terms of dynamics, it creates kind of a one-directional political change. Instead of the pendulum, which one could see in economic policy generally, right when government comes, less taxes, left government comes, more taxes, etc. And there you go. Uh, in the cultural sphere, it's usually one way. So progressives, if they win, they anchor, they increase the scope of human rights, they adopt new laws, anchoring certain uh, norms in the Constitution, etc. Conservatives try to stop them. In some countries, they can revoke rights, etc. The United States is the case in court, because, thanks to the Supreme uh, Court. But it generally happens rarely. So the effect, is, I believe, is asymmetrical. Those who are protected by constraints, which are kind of the progressives, are happy with the situation. Those who are constrained in their preferences, which are the traditionalists, the conservatives, they're not happy with it, because they are constrained. Yeah, and I think that this is kind of uh, the thing. In the older democracies in Western Europe, uh, because of the history after the Second World War, and because Christian democracy became a big thing there, and the right-wing conservatives were discredited, there was this gradual socialization of voters, first and foremost, but also the elites on the mainstream right, into this whole liberal democracy game. And it worked out pretty well which didn't happen in new democracies, which just suddenly emerged and all those parties also emerged and the voters weren't socialized into democracy. Right. And the democratic reforms in uh, Central and Eastern Europe were kind of elite driven. It's usually sad, focused on kind of this procedural understanding of democracy, emphasizing the rule of law, European integration, all that kind of stuff, human rights as well. Uh, not whether you know political outcomes correspond to the preferences of the population. In fact, in economic realm, it was very much the case that a lot of people were afraid that we shouldn't listen to the people because they will want populist left-wing economic policies, which is bad. So specifically, they tried to kind of constrain the majority in making decisions in that field. Uh, but something similar also happened on the cultural dimension, right? Whether uh, kind of, if you wanted it or not, if you wanted to get into the European Union, you had to accept a certain uh, level of human rights uh, and international obligations, etc. Um, yeah, and this is kind of what drove the conservatives um, 
in the newer democracies especially, to gradually shift their allegiance from supporting liberal democracy to opposing it. Especially, uh, I think it usually happened first at the voter level, at the grassroots level, uh, because for the time being, in the beginning, the elites were very much into this joining the European Union, maintaining consensus politics um, mindset. But then it turned out that systematically, traditionalist voters cannot get what they want to get just because this is now constrained by the law, both domestically and internationally. Um, and so it is the conservatives, I think, that uh, realize that this creates a lot of popular dissatisfaction with democracy. And this potential, this dissatisfaction, can be used uh, to turn against, of course, the liberal, the, the liberal policies anchored in the Constitution and in the political system. But then you can also use it then to attack the whole political system, and you kind of have to, because that's the only way to overturn those policies, since they are locked in institutionally. And you can also do that to then attack not only the liberal constraints, but also the democratic political pluralism itself. Because, well, why not? And because you will probably face a lot of backlash once you start dismantling liberal institutions anyway. So you might as well deal away with the democratic part of it as well. Of course, without explicitly <laughs> saying so. So they're usually very vocal about polarizing on the cultural cleavage, but not very vocal about undermining the democratic elements of this. Um, and here is kind of wh where the populist thing comes in. So for me, uh, populism is somewhat epiphenomenal. Because populism, kind of as a rhetorical device, works out really well. Because majoritarianism is all about, you know, kind of disregarding minority rights, etc. So it goes well together with these attacks on the minority rights um, as part of the liberal constraints. But then populism also has these anti-elite connotations, etc., which are not that important. Conservatives for mainstream conservatives, because they are very much part of the elite. They are the mainstream, right? And this is what we talked about today for quite a while, I think. Um, I think Petra said that, you know, populists quite often seem to attack only specific parts of the elite. I mean, namely the elites that oppose them, right? Whereas they, they're very much also part of the elite. And I think this shows that, you know, analyzing these challenges in terms of populism is less useful. I mean, sure, they use populist rhetoric, and it tells us something, but the deeper reason why they oppose liberal democracy and dismantle it is not because they're populist. They became populist because they decided to oppose liberal democracy. And they decided to oppose liberal democracy because it was the only way to dismantle the institutionally locked in liberal policies. At least that's at the level of the voters, because at the level of the elites, it is the case in some uh, countries, I think, for example, I would say that peace is probably, to a certain extent, driven by ideological considerations such as this, or it can be purely driven by material gains. I would say that Fidesz, for instance, is more interested in state capture, um, and this kind of playing with the cultural dimension is more of a way to actually gain popular support for that, uh, and sneakily um, snuck in the uh, state capture dimension. And I will finish here and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dukren. Now I'll give the floor to Alexander Klein, also from Freie University in Berlin, to exclude or to enlighten on the use of civilizational discourse by liberal EU actor. So no PowerPoint. It's late, uh, I know. So surprisingly, thanks for having me. Not my first time in DC though. I was born here. But lived abroad in Europe most of my life. And I'm currently a PhD researcher at Script at the Freie Universität of uh, Berlin. And this presentation is mostly a shorter <laughs> version of what my dissertation would be. Because we can still work on it. So, in short, I'm trying to make sense of civilizational discourse. Why it's being invoked, why it's happening, what makes this type of discourse distinct, and what implications does this have? On a theoretical level, there is literature on this, a lot of literature. But mostly focused on the illiberal and non-liberal invocations. Like looking at the literature of civilizationism, uh, you have Burbacher in 2017 who said 
when analyzing uh, populists in Western and Northwestern Europe, said that uh, civilizationism is a phenomenon which is similar to nationalism, but it's also distinct in the sense that it results in a different imagined community than nation. Uh, in his analysis, analysis, he was looking at the illiberal evocations of liberalism, and so we're excluding the other. Whereas the Muslim was built as a refugee immigrant, was built as illiberal and anti-Western. We are liberal, therefore we have to exclude them. It was a way of using liberal values to exclude the other. Uh, that's what's been after. Then there's another one by Betitza, Bolton, and Lewis, published this year, where he's, he made an interesting argument we're looking at how, how, let's say, Russia, China, India, actors in the Middle East, and illiberal groups in Europe are invoking civilizationism in order to contest the liberal international order and liar, and liberalism per se. What does this mean? Liberal liar is universal. It's globalism. You have a way of, let's say, you have the UN system, equilateralism, and so on, and most countries have to respect these values. Uh, however, that's been contested through, let's say, Russia's aggression in Ukraine and so on. So, in short, his, their argument is that these countries are invoking civilizational values in order to say liberal values do not apply to us, we have our own values derived from our history, therefore it's a way of contesting, let's say, what they, was, like, what, uh, they say that, let's say, Western liberalism is defined by decadence, by gay rights, which are foreign to Russian values and so on. So that's in a way what happens. And if you look at the empirics, you have Putin who claims that Russia is a great thousand-year-old power, a whole civilization, and it's not going to live by the Western-led rules-based orders, false rules. Then you have Xi Jinping, who says the Chinese nation has a civilization spanning over 5,000 years, which, through the Communist Party, it overcame its civic colonial status and became a masters of their future. India under Modi, the BJP is invoking it. And if we shift our focus to EU parties, which is our interest, Orban is known to have invoked this type of discourse since 2015. Uh, Hungary is part of a Christian European civilization, and usually in his yearly meeting in Transylvania in Bele Kushnad, he usually makes really controversial comments about European civilization and Hungary being in the forefront. And I also to remind that Trump, when he went to Warsaw, had his Warsaw speech we mentioned Western civilization 10 times, something most presidents of the US avoid from doing. Surprisingly, surprisingly, this has shown that most analysis of the middle liberal side. But what about the liberal side? If you look throughout history in the 19th century, uh, civilizational discourse has always been included with liberal discourse. Uh, jo uh, John Stuart Mill talked about civilization, lots of liberal thinkers. But somehow, in today's world, it tends to be a socially liberal. But there's one exception, actually, and he's over there, Macron, you can see his picture there, who always invokes the idea of European civil civilization. Uh, there's actually an interesting argument saying that this is an exception because France has a history of la mission civilisatrice. I'm sorry, it's in French, but yeah. And while Macron defines European civilization in liberal terms, uh, using the term freedom, protection, progress, it also has a colonial legacy. As in, in a G20 meeting, he actually said to an African journalist that Africa has a civilizational problem, which doesn't look good, it's problematic, you know. And we'll actually see this problematic later in the paper. But the thing is, the fact that he uses liberal values to define it, and the fact that he isn't uh, illiberal in the sense of like what Kubacker said, that there might be something more to this. And surprisingly, the war in Ukraine has shown much more use of civilizational discourse. Uh, reacting to Putin's Valdai speech, similar to the Bayer Tushnak speech of Orban, uh, Putin has a meeting in Valdai where he talks about his worldview, and this year last year was 90% about civilizations. Uh, Borrell had his Garden and Jungle speech, which I'm going to analyze here more of, uh, thoroughly, which I would argue is purely civilizational and could actually explain liberal civilizationism. But also Zelensky, who during uh, Russia's invasion said uh, that. Uh, Russia's invasion is the sound of a new iron curtain lowering and closing Russia away from the civilized world. Then you have uh, Zelensky's chief of staff, who after the event in Israel on October 7th, said that Ukraine stands with Israel, 
and he even critiqued Putin's Valdai speech, saying that in the modern world, civilization exists only as the antithesis of barbarism, and it cannot be built on hatred. So you have lots of examples of Zelensky invoking it, and uh, the thing is, there's something to it. There's something liberal about this. And uh, yeah, wait. the thing is, if you look at it, the examples here, like Putin always talks about the plurality of civilizations. However, Zelensky and lots of liberal examples use a dichotomy, civilized barbarian, even though it's usually masked differently. So the thing is, how can you make sense of the liberal use? Because I think it has whole, lots of implications also on the future of liberalism, future of world order, and so on. So looking at the literature, it's one thing it's going to mention is that the specter of Huntington always lies in this topic. Every time you talk about civilization, people think, oh, you're Huntingtonian. Nope, not the case. But the thing is, this has limited our ability to actually analyze this phenomenon. Uh, the thing is that, the, but however, there's something interesting in Huntington. The fact that he actually published his clash of civilization of Jesus as a reaction to Fukuyama's uh, uh, idea of end of history. This shows that from the very beginning, the idea of civilization was contesting this post-historical world, which I think is a common trend that has been used in over years. Even though our understanding of civilization has changed, and I think your paper is one of the best on defining it, and I use it a lot in the paper I wrote. Uh, what interests me mostly is the fact that like people assume that civilizations are essentialist uh, or like identities, uh, hunting that sort of as real, but it's mostly like socially imagined constructs, identities that are invoked, it, it overlaps a lot. So my question is, how does a civilizational worldview entail, what's entail? And what I propose is providing an ideological lens to civilizational history. And I think intellectual history can be useful to and there are three authors I saw I cite, Maslish, Oscar Hamel, and Daniel, who I think can actually give us an interesting take on how civilization relates to ideology. So the thing is, you cannot be understood. So the first thing, though, while Huntington denied the idea of universal civilization, and most scholars overlook the idea of the classical civilized barbarian uh, dichotomy, the thing is, you can't talk about civilization without the other opposite. It's always, and this is one thing that's really important, the concept of civilization was coined in the Enlightenment. It sought to put a name to this idea of us versus the other. And uh, it's a yardstick. It's, in a way, through this worldview, you assess yourself to the other. And uh, the argument I'm trying to make, and that's what most intellectual historians said, and I want to adapt it to understanding today's illiberalism and liberalism, is that this Nazi can be used, it can, can use elements of other ideologies. It could use liberalism, illiberalism, conservatism, socialism. So this is where I talk about how civilizationalism can be understood as a thin cent ideology, a, top, a thing used by freedom to define feminism, free thought, nationalism, and by Casmude, populism. A thin cent ideology restricts itself to a narrow core uh, becoming a single issue, or at most double issue, uh, which in a way borrows elements from different ideologies. So this seems to fit civilizationism, which has three elements. Firstly, the yardstick. Secondly, an emphasis on a political project and narratives. Think of the civilizational decline joke, or things like that. And thirdly, historical facilities and legitimation. Jumping into Borel's speech, which I think you should read it because it's really insightful. It was delivered at the College of Europe at the European Diplomatic Academy. And he defines Europe as a garden where, quote, everything works and represents the best combination of political freedom, economic prosperity, and social cohesion that mankind has been able to build. And this is the result of strong institutions which supply the quality of life for its people, which guarantees a neutral independent judiciary system of distributing revenue, free elections, where there are red lights controlling the traffic, and people taking the garbage, quoting the chief of foreign effects of the EU. The rest, however, is the jungle, the, where the law of the strongest is eroding agreed international norms, which sort of reminds me of a liberalism, to be honest. 
anti-institutionalism and things like that. So in a way, rather than what Brubacher said, uh, that uh, civilizational you know, discourse is being used by populists to exclude the other, what he's, like what uh, Borel is doing is literally trying to exclude the illiberal by saying it's a jungle, and he's actually critiquing the Council of Fortress Europe by saying that if we build walls, the jungle will still corrupt the garden. I know, really bad language. But only for you EU diplomats who go abroad to enlighten the jungle on how to act can the jungle be kept away and, and, and encroached. And it gets even more weird from this. He actually uses the idea of the city on the hill, which is quite liberal, and also even saying that Europe is so great, that's why illegal like refugees and illegal migrants and irregular migrants, the way he phrases it, decide to, decide to come to Europe and not to Russia. So the EU became a garden due to the end. Interestingly enough, there's one more citation I'd really like to mention. He also critiques neocolonialism. Even though we might see this speech as really colonial, he actually says, while Europeans can go with a bulldozer and money and workers and build a road, doing it for the other, rather than aiding them in institutional building, could be interpreted as a form of neocolonialism. Plus, he also says he's not a neocon, lots of things. So the thing is he makes the argument that the beauty of the European experience is overcoming the heritage of the past. Europe used to be a jungle, but through European integration, it became a garden. So in a way, Borel talks about how Europe managed to overcome identity politics. And uh, in short, Borel's experience traveling around the world, the jungle sees the garden as a beacon, and so on, which is, yeah. Lastly, it, uh, how is this civilization? Two more minutes, I'll finish right now. There is a yardstick we derived from liberalism, which is a bit unrefined, but there is still a liberal one. The idea is that the garden is defined in liberal values, institutions, liberal values, European values. And it, it also conflates the garden with the liberal international order, by even saying that not even all actors in the West follow international law which is an interesting critique, but yeah. There's also the emphasis on how the jungle is a strong man's rule, blackmail, and things like that, which literally shows the liberal, non-liberal, illiberal cleavage. Secondly, there's a different way of conceptualizing civilizational identity, which is not essentialized. It's built on values. It's built on the other adopting like European values which is a proof of Europe's greatness, the fact that Europe was able to overcome this identity traffic. Second point is that there's also a political project. Besides the fact that this is what EU diplomats have to do, which is obviously political, it's also institutionalized building, so it shows the political dimension of this instant ideology. And lastly, there's a narrative for legitimizing the EU and its democratic mission, defining the EU as a privilege, and European identity is a unique blend where people can become European not born European. So lastly, what is the border Boyle is creating? Unlike what Brubacher proposed, it's more of a civic border based on values, but also what Eisenstadt called a sacred identity. The world is divided into in-group and out-group, and you could join the in-group. You could adopt the values, which I argue and will further develop is civilization. So concluding remarks, uh, I do think, and seeing well, how this is being invoked more and more, especially now in light of what's happening in the Middle East, where things are used in international terms, it's becoming much more prominent, and I think analyzing this is much needed. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. And last but not least, we have Jack Thompson from the University of Amsterdam, identifying informal illiberalism toward the typology of norm erosion. Um, so first of all, thanks so much to the crew here um, for, for organizing this conference, um, for inviting me. Uh, it's, very well organized. it's been both very well organized and very well run, which is not always the case uh, with these types of conferences, so thank you. Um, I see a lot of tired people. Uh, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, as short as possible uh, because I'm also very tired at this point, very jet lagged. Um, let's make sure this is working yet. Okay. So, um, a bit of background. It's probably necessary to understand 
kind of what I'm doing here today. Um, uh, this paper is, I think, essentially the second part of a two-part project um, that I'm doing with other colleagues, but working on with other colleagues, um, such as Gulnaz, the University of Amsterdam. Um, the first part of the project, which I'm not really talking about today, but which is related to this, actually focuses on the United States, the 1990s and the 2000s. Um, and this is kind of a, an outgrowth of that project. It's still very early stages. Um, so if it seems patchy, or if I haven't really kind of thought things through yet, that's true. Um, but it's, it's, it's more a function of I'm really new to the project, I'm new to the subject. Can you use the um, mic, please? Mike, thank you. Is that better? Yes. A bit too tall, so it's... Um, <laughs> Um, I'll do my best to, to lean down. Um, we know that norms are crucial uh, in democracy. Um, the Vitsky and Ziplot in their, um, their seminal 2018 book, How Democracy Should Die, um, they, they, they mention norms frequently. Um, they focus on a couple specifically. Um, and we see norms mentioned a lot in kind of the literature in general. However, um, there's, there's very little systematic research uh, on norms. Um, and so, and what do I mean when I say norms? And there's lots of kind of definitions floating around there, but for my purpose is today, um, norms are essentially kind of the unwritten rules, the unwritten ideas, practices, behaviors that um, are, that kind of fill in the, the, the gaps between kind of the, the legal and the formal aspects of democracy. Um, so my focus here today is going to be on uh, developing Psychology and norms to try to to try to kind of start the process of developing a, system, a systematic way of thinking about what norms are important um, and how they kind of interact with each other um, and the role they play in this kind of this this broader subject of um, democratic backsliding. Um, so the typology focuses on uh, it's, it's a list of ten norms. Uh, we can argue about which norms uh, should or should be there. Um, it devises three different categories of norms, um, and then it kind of links the, the list of ten norms to some prominent themes of uh, liberal politics. Um, and so basically the whole point of this is to work toward developing a comprehensive list of key norms, um, begin evaluating how these norms kind of relate to each other and the processes by which they're eroded, uh, and then to, and this, for me this is kind of the payoff here, the most interesting part, is to begin identifying transnational patterns in norm erosion, in norm erosion especially in the transatlantic. So not just what norms that are voting in the United States or in Europe or in other parts of the world, but kind of the, the broader kind of interconnectedness. Um, right, just a, a brief word on methodology. Um, so the, the first paper that I mentioned a moment ago that, that focuses on the United States, um, to an extent kind of the, the methodology that I'm thinking about using here, borrows from that. And it's essentially kind of focusing, I'm interested in the grassroots, um, fringe political parties. Um, when I'm not out conducting surveys, I'm not using opinion polling data. Um, so I, to an extent, I'm, I'm focusing on kind of what you might think of as the elites of the grassroots and the elites of fringe political parties. Um, I'm a historian by training, so I apologize in advance to all the political scientists here for um, what may seem strange methodology to you. But for the most part, what I'm my approach here is contemporary history, uh, with a little bit of political science, a little bit of uh, sociology spread with it. Um, oh, and the, the, the list of norms um, that I'll show you in a minute. Um, a number of these norms are, are actually found in the, in the literature, but some aren't. Um, and so this is, again, this is, goes back to this idea that there isn't really a systematic approach to this yet in the literature. So, um, if some of the, and I'll tell you which, which, which norms are in the literature and which norms I've basically kind of identified uh, in my own research, um, and that's certainly something that we can uh, discuss or argue about. Right, um, so here you see the, the list of the, the 10 norms that I've identified, and I'm not gonna read um, each definition, uh, it's in the paper, the, the, the detailed outline that was circulated. Um, what I will do is kind of is briefly mention uh, some examples to start to give you a sense of the fact that this is um, that, that all of these norms are, are eroding on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so, for example, for, for mutual mutual toleration, which is one of the norms um, 
identified in the literature. Um, I mean, we see eroding mutual toleration in the U.S., both kind of when you look at opinion polling data in the U.S., um, both large majorities um, of both political parties essentially view um, people in the other political party as, as immoral, as, um, as, as really kind of um, uh, degrading democracy. Um, in the 2022 uh, French presidential election, the Stop the Steel conspiracy theory, which kind of originated in the 2020 U.S. presidential election, um, uh, played a role. Institutional forbearance. Um, the, the Trump administration encouraged the Department of Justice to uh, investigate uh, political, uh, political opponents in Congress. Um, the Polish, uh, on, on the other side of the Atlantic, the Polish Law and Justice Party formed a commission um, to investigate uh, alleged Russian influence in the country in politics. Constitutional protections. Um, Trump White House officials routinely ignored uh, congressional subpoenas. Democratic affiliation. Um, we talked about QAnon earlier today. Uh, Donald Trump kind of very carefully at first and then uh, much more openly embraced QAnon. And the odd day in Germany has multiple links to the Heichsberg movement. Um, pluralism. The, the 2017 legislation, the so-called RAISE Act, uh, didn't actually pass, um, but it was very overtly anti-immigrant. Um, acceptance of relevant facts. On both sides of the, the, the Atlantic, um, you have uh, significant political movements which deny the, the, the importance of human caused climate change. Uh, avoiding so-called legal corruption. Um, in the US, you have a, a pretty clearly recognized pay-to-play culture. Systemic legitimacy. Um, for example, in the US, um, the, the Republican Party, um, it, it's now uh, kind of a central part of uh, conservative political culture that the, the, the media is, is, is exoriated. Nonviolence, obviously um, signals from the from mainstream Republicans that the January 6, 2021 uh, insurrection is okay. It's a good example of uh, the erosion of that norm. Um, and then finally, democratic multilateralism. Uh, you have skepticism about uh, NATO and other multilateral institutions now a mainstream position. Um, obviously, the Republican Party here in the United States. Um, but in Germany, for example, the new uh, Bundeswagenpakt uh, um, says NATO skeptical, skeptical of other multilateral institutions. So that's a very quick, but run down of some examples, but hopefully it gives you kind of a flavor. Um, so, so you see here the, the typology, I'll get to that in a minute, but just to give you some, some a bit more explanation about the typology. So in addition to the list of norms that I just ran through quickly, um, I've devised three norm categories. So you have rhetorical norms uh, that are eroding, and these are these are norms that are primary primarily eroded through things that people say. You have behavioral norms, uh, norms that are eroded primarily through things that people do. And then attitudinal norms. These are basically kind of changing beliefs um, that, that undermine democracy. Or really change the belief, changing beliefs related to democracy. And then I've identified, um, and these are, these are subjective, so we can certainly identify others, but in terms of research that I've been doing, three themes kind of jump out at me as, um, as particularly kind of salient when we talk about kind of democratic backslide. One is distrust, um, growing distrust uh, in most democracies, uh, both of kind of um, political institutions, but distrust of, 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 of each other. Radicalization is an obvious one, um, but I think to be a bit more specific, I, I think we can identify both an increase in quantity and intensity of the liberal behavior of many democratic states. And then finally, again, nationalism seems like an obvious one, and I should probably specify, I'm talking more about kind of extreme kind of populist nationalism here. Um, most democracies have significant political parties or movements that reject liberalism, multilateralism, um, and embrace both domestically and internationally the liberal states and actors. 
So, and I won't, I won't linger here for too long, but you can start to see how kind of these different pieces then fit together in the typology. Um, so, as I mentioned at the outset, this is still a very new project, so I haven't had the time to really start thinking through kind of higher level takeaways yet. Um, but already, with just a little bit of thought, I think there's um, a couple of things that we can see in this typology. The first is if, <clears throat> if you look at the, the typology, I think eight of the 10 norms that are identified here are associated with more than one type of long roach. So mutual toleration um, is associated with both attitudinal and rhetorical long erosion. Institutional forbearance is associated with both, both behavioral and rhetorical long erosion. So that's kind of a very initial um, kind of takeaway for me is that Norm erosion is associated, it's, it's, it's a complex process. And it's associated with multiple factors interacting with each other at the same time, with multiple types of norm erosion interacting at the same time. Um, the three themes that, that, uh, that I've highlighted, distrust, radicalization, national, uh, nationalism, <clears throat> um, so the, the Kind of the research that I've done um, suggests to me, at least, that these different types of normal erosion, different types of normal erosion, are specifically correlated with um, specific types of kind of these, these broader um, manifestations of, of uh, democratic practice like we're saying. So, rising distrust is correlates with the erosion of mutual toleration, um, the erosion of um, acceptance of relevant facts. Um, avoiding corruption and systemic legitimacy. And then finally, another thing that kind of has jumped out for me in the research um, <laughs> is the extent to which um, there are just a plethora of linkages um, in terms of what's uh, the erosion of norms on both sides of the Atlantic. Right? So you have direct linkages. In other words, kind of the direct um, uh, kind of use of the stop the steal uh, conspiracy theory in the 2022 French elections. Um, and that's lifted almost directly from kind of the stop the steal conspiracy theory in the 2020 US election. Um, and you have kind of these indirect linkages, kind of network building, and kind of the descent of the flow back and forth of ideas. So one example that I was speaking with a couple of people today at lunchtime about was the, the pilgrimage of US conservatives to, to Hungary, for example to go and see kind of the ways in which um, in Hungary Orban is building kind of a, a specific version of illiberal democracy, which is appealing to, to, to a lot of um, um, grassroots, uh, grassroots Republicans. Um, so obviously, I mean, just, just to close, uh, there's still very early days in terms of the research, um, but it's, it's pretty clear to me that there's, there's a lot more scholarship in terms of identifying, kind of trying to nail down the identify the, the precise means by which links, connections, or forms. In other words, kind of we see this norm erosion happening on both sides of the Atlantic, elsewhere as well. Um, but how precisely? Um, why? Why are the same processes occurring um, in parallel in different countries at the same time? Um, right. I'll stop there. Thanks. We have about 25 minutes now for the discussion. So, oh, I see a lot of questions. That's great. Let's begin there in the back. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, to the lady here. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I'm Adas Saron, and I'm actually new to GW. Um, so, thank you, all of you. It was very interesting. My question is for Alexander. Um, so I wonder, I was listening to you thinking about this civilizational discourse, and it sounds very much like modernization theory, but not optimistic 
right? So as if, as if instead of the success of bringing modernization to the world, it's sort of the despair of doing that. But Eisenstadt, you know, Eisenstadt is just modernization theory, so I wonder if it's just the other side of the coin, this fatigue of still belief in modernization, but not believing that it's actually going to work. I wonder if, if there is something of that. Really? There was a question here, Petra, and then in the back. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a question for Mikhail, and I think uh, I'm quite sympathetic to that. I believe there is something with uh, conservative parties. There is uh, something uh, in there. But I think what I would want perhaps from you to have a more fine-grained approach, not just throwing them all in one bucket. And I think we, we know we have observed, and you can go at it empirically, it's going to help you, by looking at conservative mainstream parties which uh, radicalized, but also conservative uh, parties that did not radicalize. And I would like to echo Hannah Arendt's um, quote from Lutzo Pezon, it could happen everywhere, but it doesn't happen everywhere. So that, that, is, uh, that is a point, point there. And to Jack, I mean, I was really, really excited for this, because I think we really need such a typology. But I'm a bit puzzled about, like, I would need, perhaps it's too much of a social scientist in me, I would need a systematic approach to it. Because, and not just like, where do these norms, norms come from? I mean, it's partially like how democracy dies, but other things throw into it, how did they come there? But I think most importantly, like some of these norms are not informal. Some of these norms are constitutionally codified, and they are not equal, and their effect and their erosion is not equal to the depth of democratic erosion. And I, and I think it needs a systematic approach rooted in theory, and then I would like to see, so for the first heuristic kind of, not even grounded theory approach, this, this, this is great. But I think systematically, it would uh, it would need to be taken, distinguishing the quality of norms, looking at what is being targeted, how it's being targeted. Is it um, politicians in power? Is it external groups, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. I think it's a huge would be a huge literature. I would start with a global literature review on this, so that you can stand on the shoulders. I really think this is a worthwhile. Pro project we really need, but I would like to see more. Thank you. Hi, Eric Mans at USA. Um, Mikhail, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, about the, I, the kind of compatibility between conservatives and uh, their kind of anti pluralistic tendencies. Um, there's, I think you can go one step farther. And this is a term that I haven't heard today, is the captured state. So successful illiberal regimes have captured the state, which basically is the eliminating of pluralism. Um, and the reason they do this is for power and money. So, it, and it goes back to your question of loyalty. What is common about these illiberal uh, regimes is they are fully, the, the one principle that rules all is loyalty, just like with Donald Trump. So, I mean, they are basically mafia gangs. They become mafia gangs that capture all the different institutions of the state in order to maintain power. And the illiberal ideology, in many cases, is just a cover story. And, I mean, uh, Orban has done that well, but so has Vucic, so has Rama in Albania. And even Fizzo now, who is a social democrat, has become illiberal because he knows it's good for business to be able to maintain his mafia state. So I think this is, you know, this is, you're going all the way in that direction. It's just like a natural step to go farther. And maybe, so just nearby, yeah, and then we will do a second one. Um, thank you. Well, my comment uh, is for Alexander, my 
question also. I agree with you that civ about civilizationism absolutely comes from many liberals in Europe, uh, but it does not only come from the fringes, absolutely. But it's not only about the values. I mean, I think there's also um, this idea also because of economic reasons. Um, I'll explain because it links with ideas such as recolonization, for example. Um, in Germany, I mean, the Germany's Africa commissioner he said that Af African countries should lease their lands to foreign countries, European countries, for a period of 50 years in order to develop. He said this in 2018. Uh, I mean, and this also, this idea comes from uh, a Nobel Prize winner, the economist um, Paul Romer, when he talks about charter cities and the same idea of creating charter cities, uh, for example, in Africa, by leasing territory to foreign countries in order to develop. So there's more to civilizationism than just values. That's all. Thank you. Let's begin reverse order. Jack, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, so, <laughs> so thanks. I, mean, I think you saw from kind of my initial remarks. Like I'm aware that this is um, microphone. I'm aware that this is um, it's it's a gigantic potential undertaking. Um, I didn't set out to create a you know the the um, kind of definitive typology of bones. I just kind of stumbled into it because I realized that there wasn't anything. Um, and there's a practical problem as well in that I'm a historian. And so historians don't use typologies in their work, um, almost ever. Um, so I'm, I think it's unlikely that I'm going to kind of go the route that you're suggesting, which I, I totally understand why you suggest it, um, but to actually do the type of kind of um, more theoretical and painstaking work that you're suggesting is just not practical for me. Um, but I understand why you, why you, you make that comment. Um, just to quibble with you a little bit, so, I mean, I wouldn't say I've done a, a global review, review of the literature, but I have, I mean, I have looked at the literature on norms. The problem is there isn't much. For the most part, when norms are discussed in literature, it's kind of in passing. Um, most of the norms in the typology, they are actually, do actually come from the literature. Um, I didn't include it in the, the, the PowerPoint presentation, but in the, in the, the outline that was circulated, where there's literature to, to kind of root these norms in, yes, I did. Um, but I mean, I, I take a broader point. It's, it's, a, it's a still very early days, and it's a super, it needs to be kind of much narrower um, much more focused, um, and in the end they'll probably write more of a historical kind of narrative take on this, so looking at a few norms. Um, um, but this is just a way for me to kind of start thinking through what are the key norms and how do they interact with each other. So, but thanks for the comment. So I have two questions. Should I use this one? So, regarding the first one, regarding modernization theory, so I might have been unclear in my presentation. The idea of the civilization decline trope is but one example. You also have the example of more optimistic views of the future of one civilization. The idea being uh, in China, with the Chinese economic miracle, or even the way they define the state ideology, socialist with Chinese characteristics. Like, you do have that dimension. And uh, there's also discussions on the idea of eco-civilization, which is beyond my scope of my research. I was just noticing it while doing some things. And uh, it tries to frame sustainable development and the transition towards a sustainable future in civilizational terms, which I find an example of the use of civilizational narrative for a view on the future which is more optimistic. And decline. And looking in the literature, actually, the idea of multiple modernities has been analyzed. You had Eisenstein who talked about it, Kartenstein and his conceptualization of civilizations in the world of plurality, plurality talks about civilizations as either processes, which are real, meaning multiple modernities within a context of a global modernity, and the other one, which is 
an identity, a pre-fourth identity. So my main analysis isn't on civilizations as a process, it's more on it as an ideologist identity of, un of understanding reality, if that answers your question. And the second one is regarding the, the unfortunate discussions of German commissioner on Africa, which I have no idea. I'm going to do some more research on it. But I can tell you that this, I, one could argue that this is more of a colonialism uh, idea. Like, sure, colonialism and civilizationalism has always been intertwined. But it could also be not in intertwined. Like, you could technically argue that both are set ideologies. I am not so sure that civilized, like, colonialism is inherently part, like, it could be an ideology that thickens uh, civilizationalism. And I'm also thinking of the multiple ways it was used. My biggest fear with expanding it so much would be that civilization can become an empty signifier. It, if it needs everything, it needs nothing. So what exactly is it? And uh, yeah, that's in a way my interest, I'm still developing it, if that answers the question. Is it on? Yeah, all right. Yes, uh, first question, Petra. Yeah, thank you so much. I totally agree that it's, I mean, very interesting to think about why some conservatives radicalize, whereas others do not, and it's basically also something which I'm kind of looking at at my dissertation. Um, I mean, I, the way I see it, yes, it's always a choice, and that's the whole point of this semi loyalty thing, right? That you can choose whether in this kind of context democracy makes sense for you or not. It's a choice. You can choose either way. It's interesting to study why some actors choose one way and the others choose a different way. I mean, one factor here which is important, I think, is whether the extent to which the cultural dimension is salient or not. Because I mean, for some parties and voters, it's more important than others. I mean, some conservative parties uh, do not emphasize the cultural dimension as much as they emphasize the economic dimension, which then is a different story. Even though you can also oppose liberal democracy uh, kind of based on your particular preferences for certain economic policies, if you try to defend them from the popular will, for instance, a Russian story in the 90s and the early 2000s, in a way. Um, but there are also, I mean, other reasons they can do it. So I'm not arguing that all conservative parties that oppose democracy, liberal democracy, do so because they're conservative parties. There can also be other reasons. And this actually segues nicely into the second question of state capture and whether a liberal ideology is just a cover story. I mean, it can be that way for sure. And I would say that, I mean, I treat populism in a way as a cover-up story for a liberal conservatives. But I do still think that, uh, first of all, there it's an empirical question, the extent to which it matters by, by itself. For instance, I would say like in Poland seems to be the case that, I mean, Kind of the material gains have not materialized, at least for Kaczynski and his cronies, uh, to the extent they materialized in Hungary, maybe because they wanted as much but just didn't succeed in that. Could be, right? I'm not a specialist in the Polish case. But could also be because they actually wanted, you know, a liberal policies push through just much more. For Fidesz, I agree, it's a cover-up story, and Fidesz has a fascinating history started with a like an anti authoritarian liberal student youth movement and ending up where it is now in their quest for power and money for sure. Um, and yet again there is something to be said about kind of conservatism and the liberalism um, as kind of the cover story which is often used. It's not the only one, you can use other ones, you can use left wing populism, etc. you can come up with something else. But the fact that it is so often something which is similar across different contexts, I think means that we should be looking at it seriously and not treating it automatically, right? Uh, assuming that it is just the cover story. But in some cases it is. The second round of questions. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have a question for Jack, um, which sort of follows on from what Petra was saying earlier about um, distinguishing between norms on the one hand and law on the other, because I think that this is something that you're, regardless of the approach that you end up taking, um, give, based on the examples that you've given, you're going to have to um, be very clear about the distinction between um, a 
a sort of uh, what is normative and what is um, in many cases a legal requirement. If I look, for example, at respecting adverse election results, I mean, this is clearly something that um, all participants in a democracy are bound to do in accordance with the law rather than just a norm that they can choose to respect or not. Same with I mean, things like constitutional protections. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, Jarosław Kaczynski befriending the uh, head of the Constitutional Tribunal is, ob is um, arguably a breach of normative propriety. On the other hand, refusing to print Constitutional Tribunal rulings because you disagree with their content is a breach of the law. Um, and the second thing I would say is that it would be useful also to try to differentiate between the content of a norm and the intentions that lie behind its uh, violation or whether it's respected. I'll give, to give an example, as I mentioned earlier, in the Polish case, we have a, um, a situation in which law and justice has um, both won and lost the election. One in the sense of um, having the majority of seats in, par in Parliament lost because it doesn't have an obvious coalition partner. And this creates an, an, is an issue for designating the Prime Minister, because according to norms, the party with the largest um, proportion of the seats should get the first go at trying to elect a Prime Minister. However, in practice we know that this is going to be impossible for peace to realise. And we know also that Andrzej Duda is delaying this in part because he wants to give law and justice time to tidy up some of its loose ends and shreds of documents. In a situation like that, what norm is being breached here? Is it the norm that the largest party should have first go at electing a prime minister? Or is it the norm that, a credit, uh, that we should, uh, a president should seek to find the most credible um, group of parties that can create a parliamentary majority? So sometimes what seems to be the norm that is being violated is not necessarily as important as the intention that lies behind it. Thanks for the great papers. It was a really nice session. The question is for the entire panel, anybody who wants to address it. Um, so we have a quote here on the back wall. The democracy requires an informed citizenry able to question its government. And it, so it would seem that an informed citizenry is that entity which is best positioned to address some of these problems of illiberalism that we've discussed today in all of the different panels. And yet, we have a citizenry that's increasingly prone to conspiracy theories. We have a, a citizenry that, that uh, is increasingly unaware of, of the nuances of current events and is not, I mean, there's simply not enough time in the day to read and inform oneself about all of the issues of government. I mean, and then we have people who believe that James Ball is a fake name. We, there's, there's all kinds of, um, deficiencies in meeting this goal. So the question is um, not so much of a, um, it, it, let, let's make it a very basic question. What is the corrective to this demand for knowledge and on the part of the citizenry and the lack of knowledge that we're seeing today? Thank you. Do we have other questions? Could I, could I ask yeah, my question is, I think, directly for Alexander Klein, which is about how civilizational rhetoric deployed by liberals can, can manifest itself or can produce illiberal outcomes. That, that's kind of the main question, but I think for the rest of the panel, I would be interested to hear you kind of interrogate the relationship between liberalism and illiberalism in general. Um, we know they're related, right? We know illiberalism is in some ways a reaction to actually practice liberalism and all these sorts of things, but I think that there is a tendency to sort of bifurcate and treat these as neat and, and separate categories at some point, right? After so much illiberal movement, you sort of break and you're now in a liberal thing, but the reason I'm, the reason that your presentation made me think of this, um, Alexander, is that I think we're in a moment now where the German vice chancellor is saying essentially that if you are not close enough to the German state's uh, stance on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and you are a foreigner, you can risk deportation. If you're a German, you can risk prosecution. In France, we have a situation where 
pro-Palestinian protests are banned outright. And there's a bill in the National Assembly to, to fine people for these sorts of things. And there's all sorts of historical examples in the United States, obviously, about these kind of what I think are clearly sort of breaks in or, or, or departures from illiberal or, or from liberal principles in practice. But I don't think that that necessarily makes the German Green Party or something like this an illiberal party or a Macron a, a, an illiberal leader or something like this per se. So I think just interrogating the relationship between liberalism and liberalism more thoroughly would be interesting too. Great point. If I can add to maybe follow very briefly on what Aaron was saying. Uh, Antonio, in your, in your presentation on the kind of relationship between liberalism and, and democracy, you mentioned the three terms that I think are really key, kind of representation, delegation, mediation. Right? And then if you think in countries that present themselves as liberal democracy, I mean, these three elements are not functioning well. Right? So it's kind of going back to the question that the erosion of norms is not necessarily coming from outsiders who present themselves as a liberal right, country. It's coming from inside the liberal system of being unable to do representation, delegation, mediation. Thinking of France, and not thinking because the, I think one of the issues is that when we discuss pluralism, we often have a vision of pluralism that has been shaped by the progressive, the today's progressive definition. It's about ethnic and minority like identity minority pluralism, but the social class pluralism, I'm sorry, I'm going back to <laughs> what Clara uh, uh, begin with, and <laughs> going back to the Marxist kind of thing, is that the social class aspect, you have entire segment of our society that have no representation, no delegation, no mediation, right? So the system itself is failing at giving space themselves, and so it's, so, so I'm kind of, putting that on the table as an ad, and just link to that also, I think, um, uh, 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 Jack, I think one of the norms that maybe, and the more you will be presenting, the more people will tell you, oh, and what about that norm, and that norm, and this norm, but what about the erosion of equality as a norm? I mean, where is the social economic aspect of the erosion in your, in your listing? Because Otherwise, it's all look like it's always political institutions that are responsible. What about the private sector sharing part of the responsibility and having, you know, accountability toward the citizens? What is where is that norms put inside the system? Otherwise, we ask politics and politicians to be responsible to change life, but their capacity to influence is just shrinking. And if there is no way the private sector and economic sector is entering. <coughs> what we define as politics, then it cannot work, right? And so I think the, the, the norm erosion is also about the, this kind of huge elephant in the room, which is the accountability of economics element in being there as a kind of the, the norm erosion of, of, of equality. So just we are finishing on opening the huge kind of <laughs> big question so, for all of us. So I give you the floor, maybe back, Jack, and then. So, okay. <laughs> Um, so first of all, Ben, yeah, so you basically made two points as I understood it. Um, the second point is about the need to kind of differentiate. Totally, totally agree. No, no, no quibbles whatsoever. Um, on the first point, um, on, so for example, respecting the adverse outcome of elections, there is both a legal and a normative component there, right? So there are, there are laws that need to be followed in terms of kind of what happens when one party wins an election and one doesn't. But there are also normative components there as well. And that's not just me. I'm actually taking that from Levitsky and Ziploc. Um, so for example, you have um, a boatload of conservatives in the United States right now um, who are now in legal trouble based on kind of things they did to actually try to overturn the, the resulting election. But you have a much larger percentage or a much larger kind of um, group of Republicans who just go around kind of verbally kind of casting doubts, raising questions. And so that is incredibly corrosive over time. And that's, that's, that didn't used to happen in the United States. So that's, that's a change in kind of a normative approach to how people talk about elections. And that's, I guess, what I was trying to get at there um, with that. Um, <laughs> Marlena, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, on the one hand, you're absolutely right. Um, on the other hand, I mean, again, as a historian, I feel like I'm speaking a foreign language at times when I'm you know, kind of grappling with these things. And so 
I mean, I really was trying to be guided by the literature and in, com in composing this list of, of ten norms. Um, I couldn't really, I, mean, I didn't see anything about kind of the erosion of, say, say equality, the, the notion that kind of we should kind of strive to have an equal society. I didn't see anything like that in the literature. So that would be me kind of really going off the reservation um, in terms of saying, well, you know, so I, I take your point, but I'm not even, you know, already, this was too big coming in. Um, the questions have indicated that it's, you know, definitely needs to be refined. Um, so I guess all I can do is kind of throw up my hand and say, yes, but I, I have no idea what to do with that. So. Okay, so I'll respond to, I think, two or three questions. Well, that's one regarding democracy, quasi informed citizenry. So I would actually respond not as like someone who's researching systems like uh, civilization, but as someone who worked in public policy for a bit, who grappled with the impact of fake news, of what's happening with, let's say, propaganda, especially Russian propaganda, and in Romania, in the European Union. Unfortunately, the solution is only through improving the educational system in order to emphasize critical thinking rather than memorization. I can tell you, like, from a Romanian perspective, the way education, the educational system is actually conceptualized is from a pre-internet age. When you have a textbook, you memorize it, there's no less debated professor, it's the classical, remember everything, regurgitate everything, and then go to college. So, you have to change that. It's to combat fake news and to combat conspiracy theories, you require to actually train people to think in a, let's say, rational way. You can't take it for granted. It sounds weird, but only through teaching people critical thinking, you could actually overcome it, if that answers your question. But remember, the people who are getting into the QAnon rabbit hole, are, they, th they are engaging in critical thinking. You know, they're piecing together the links, and it all seems very logical for them. So wouldn't that just, you know, not address the problem ultimately? Yes and no, like, that's a valid answer. But at the same time, I do think that the way the educational system is conceptualized, though I'm not into public policy anymore, I don't do research on it, is that you have to think long term. If you only want short term solution like banning Russia today, you could always make a new one with, let's say, funds and, let's say it's a whack-a-mole game. You have to think long term for long term policy. And regarding the illiberalism, liberalism one, so the thing is that in the case of Europe, it's a bit exceptional compared to the US. Freedom of speech is an absolute. In the case of Germany, showing anti-Semitism or any form of racism, Islamophobia is grounds for not receiving citizenship. It's a requirement in the German citizenship law to not be racist. And even though I can't really talk about deportation because I don't know exactly what they're talking about, the issues, uh, I, think it like, I think it depends because there have been incidents, like a synagogue was firebombed in Berlin, you had the stuff of David being done in front of some homes where you have Jews living. There are incidents. And uh, because of the historical context, the tolerance is zero. If that answers your question. Right. Uh, let me briefly address the two general questions. One is the informed citizenry, what to do about it, or the lack thereof. I'm afraid that I think that the problem is deeper. I mean, lack of informed, informed citizenry is part of the problem, but I think what is worse is that there are quite a few citizens in many countries which are pretty well informed, and they think that liberal democracy is not working out well for them. And I'm afraid to say that at least some of them are probably right, um, in terms of that they're not getting the outcomes they would like to, and they feel maybe mistakenly so, but still that another system could serve them better, either in economic terms or in some other kind of terms. And, I mean, coming from Russia, and I'm a Russian citizen, even though I've been living in Germany for several years now, and kind of have a best on political science education, um, liberal democracy is often taken for granted, but it's a very peculiar system, because in order to accept it, you have to care about political competition more than about your pref your favorite party winning all the time. Which is weird, right? Why would you want your favorite party to lose? If you really wanted to win, you wouldn't want it to lose, right? Especially if you think that the political stakes are high. This is how polarization works. Um, and so, 
it is quite natural, I think, that a significant part of the citizenry seems to think that, sure, if my party were in power all the time, I would be better off. And some of them, at least, could be right in that regard. Um, and the liberalism, the liberalism relationship, I'll just be brief. I think that liberal states very often break liberal principles, and sometimes it's not even considered liberal to do so, in a way, especially when they are fighting the liberals. And this is an interesting thing, right? Uh, the concept of militant democracy, for instance, very much prominent in Germany, is precisely about fighting threats to liberal democracy by, well, the liberal means like banning parties, etc., right? Because they're a danger. Is it kind of liberal democratic to do? Uh, not really, probably, right? Uh, but then you, you, you justify it for saying, well, we're saving liberal democracy. Um, I mean, war and terror is also kind of a, the similar logic. Like, we're fighting a bigger danger, so it's okay. Is it a liberal? Probably, I, I would say so. Uh, can liberalism, political liberalism, exist without kind of without that kind of stuff? I'm not sure. I mean, empirically, it coexists with it. In an ideal world, probably that wouldn't be necessary. But then again, if we lived in an ideal world, we probably wouldn't be doing political science. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for the question and for the action. Uh, for the quote, uh, I think it's very important for my thesis. Uh, the, this quote too, because uh, uh, I think that the civil society is not a secondary element of the, the, of the liberal democracy. And, uh, and uh, I agree with Petra uh, because uh, for this speech uh, this morning, because I think it's very, uh, it's the center of the equilibrium of the liberal democracy, of the representative democracy, and so on. And then I think. Uh, uh, I, I think it's very important that the intermediary bodies in the society, in, in the liberal democracy, especially in the liberal democracy, and so in the other form of democracy or regime. Uh, a part of a civil society today uh, do have representation, radiation, delegation, and so on. And then I think. Uh, Finally, it's uh, very important to rethinking democracy, liberal democracy and representative democracy. Thank you. Good, well, on that, I think that's a good <laughs> argument to conclude. So I wanted yeah. to thank you all, to thank all our panelists, and more globally, to thank you all of you for coming, and a special thanks to please all our staff, John, Aaron, Eric, Sarah. <laughs>